it's with great delight that I introduce Judson Brewer. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for that really warm introduction. Let's start with the definition. Uh, anxiety, you can read this. I'll read it as well. A feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. I'm standing up on stage. You don't know what's going to happen next. I don't either. The problem here is that I started getting anxious treating my patients with anxiety back when I uh, started my psychiatry practice. And the problem stems to this. These are actually pretty good numbers for medications, but this number needed to treat of 5.1 means that one in the next five patients that I see that uh, are diagnosed with anxiety are going to benefit from, or show a significant reduction in symptoms when I give them a medication. So I play the medication lottery every time I see patients because I don't know which one of the next five is going to benefit and what to do with the other four. On top of this, we've all seen this. Um, anxiety's only gotten worse in the last couple of years. So let's anchor this in a, in a real life story. I had a patient who was referred to me for anxiety. I'll spare you the details, 40 years of age, met all the criteria for anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, didn't know what to do. He tried everything, didn't want to take medications. And so starting to worry, what, what am I gonna do? Also, um, he was 400 pounds uh, when he came to see me. So very unhealthy weight. You can see from this graph that in America, we haven't done a great job of treating clinical obesity. Uh, in fact, this article just came out in the Wall Street Journal suggesting that the dominant paradigm, which is basically willpower, uh, has, has surprisingly not been working and leading to yo-yo dieting, et cetera. I like this quote attributed to Einstein, um, which suggests this may be at the heart of the problem. We've been trying to think our way out of problems forever. The problem with that is that this relies, at best, this relies on the prefrontal cortex, which is the youngest and the weakest part of the brain from an evolutionary perspective. So when we get stressed and anxious, guess which part of the brain goes offline? So you're gonna trust that when somebody says, hey, you know, just stop being anxious, stop worrying, or change whatever habit is that you're struggling with? So what this suggests, and this is what we've been studying the last couple of decades, is you know, maybe we've missed something. Or maybe, also, there's a bit of neuroscience that can help us aim in a different direction. Instead of failing and beating ourselves up from failing and then you know, signing up for another year of a program that says you just need more willpower, what if we go back to the basics? What if we look at how our brains work? Now, this is a heuristic. As a neuroscientist, I would never um, endorse this type of thing, yet here I'm presenting it to you. Uh, but the idea is that we've got, you know, we've got this prefrontal cortex that's involved in planning and, you know, for the future. What about these parts of our brains that are really deeply ingrained in helping us survive? Can we go there? This is evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug. Eric Kendall got the Nobel Prize in 2000, showing that sea slugs learn the same way as humans. So why not start there? This is what helped us remember where food is. This is what helps us remember where danger is so that we can move toward food and away from danger. Now, the twist here is that we might know this uh, cognitively from a neuroscience perspective, but how do we actually train this? And so this is, you know, I had, you know, full disclosure, I started meditating at the beginning of medical school, and I found that it was somewhat helpful for me to, like, realize how little I knew about my own brain and how little I knew about how to change my own habits. And I found that it was helpful in working with my own anxiety. I actually was used to get panic attacks during residency. Uh, very, very helpful there. So I was like, well, let's try this stuff. And in fact, uh, when I was in residency, a, a fellow resident at Yale said I was gonna kill my career uh, if I moved in this direction, because I'd been doing a bunch of, of neuroscience and, and molecular biology before that. So the paradox here is this stuff being mindfulness training. What about awareness can actually help us start to change behaviors? It might seem strange, you know, we're, uh, we're hearing about learning to focus and to bring our attention to things, but how powerful is this actually? Well, I will suggest over the next couple of minutes that this is extremely powerful. When we have people pay attention when they smoke cigarettes, they realize that cigarettes taste like crap, as you can see from this quote. And with that, we can get five times the quit rates of gold standard treatment. So something's going on there. Uh, now this, we published this a long time ago, and at that time, I was working at the VA hospital, smoke-free campus, my patients were out in the parking lot smoking. I realized, hey, my patients don't learn to smoke in my office. Can I bring my office to them? 
So we started developing and testing what are now called digital therapeutics. That was about five years before the term had been invented. But the idea is, can we take evidence-based trainings, put them in an app form, and test them to see if they work? And specifically, can we train people to pay attention and have that attention training build on itself? So I'm just going to show you some, um, some examples of some studies that have been done since then. So for example, there was a study that Ashley Mason led here at UCSF looking at this uh, eating app that we'd put together called Eat Right Now. She found a 40% reduction in craving-related eating, 35% reduction in eating to cope with negative emotions. So it was tapping into this core learning mechanism. Uh, we developed this program for anxiety. Uh, based on one of our folks in the eating program saying, hey, can you develop a program for anxiety? We started with the worst population to work with, physicians, because we're a pain in the ass. We said, can we get a signal? We could get a signal. You can see the data there. We then went on to do randomized controlled trials to see if we could actually affect change in people with generalized anxiety disorder. You can see here we got a 67% reduction in anxiety and a 64% remission rate. I want to highlight that because that's where people are reporting very little if, to no anxious symptoms. Right? This is after two months. Look at that number needed to treat 1.6. So with medications, you know, it was one in five. Here the number was even better. I'm just going to go through this quickly to give you a sense for the replicability because that's the hallmark of science. Did another study with people who are struggling to sleep, where worry was affecting their sleep. We could see significant reductions in anxiety, and we can also see significant reductions in worry interfering with sleep. And you might ask, well, what about at four months? Well, we did a study within a study here where we gave the control group the active intervention at two months to see if they could catch up, and also see if the active intervention maintained their gains. Both were true. So long story short, and you don't need to remember these, right? This is, this is just to highlight one simple point, which is if we target the mechanism psychologically, we can actually see uh, clinically significant results. So what's next? You know, I like this quote, your, your me is in the way. And we can start to ask these questions, well, what's going on in the brain here? Many of you are familiar with this network of brain regions called the default mode network. It's what we default to when we're not doing anything in particular. I think of it as the me network because we tend to think about ourselves when we're not doing anything in particular, whether it's the past or the future or even in the present moment. Well, this network also gets activated. I'm going to focus in on a couple of hubs of the default mode network. This is in this uh, red circle is the posterior cingulate cortex. It gets activated when uh, adolescents get their own Instagram pictures, and the only manipulation here is that they get a bunch of likes. So getting a bunch of likes not only activates these reward centers in our brain, like the nucleus accumbens, but also these, these me centers, these self-referential centers. Lights up like a Christmas tree uh, with, in people who are addicted to nicotine when they're shown pictures of people smoking. It also lights up pretty selectively. The more someone worries, the more this posterior cingulate gets activated. So, why am I telling you all of this? Well, we were, we were hypothesizing a while ago now that this may be an ex a phenomenon of getting caught up in our experience. And we can actually test this because that's what mindfulness training is all about, is learning to see when we're caught up in ourselves, when we're taking things personally, and to not get caught up in these things. Long story short, I, many of you have seen these studies. We did a study over 10 years ago now where we found in experienced meditators, they selectively deactivate these two hubs of the default mode network, the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex when they're meditating compared to novices. We looked across the entire brain and this, these were the only, there were only four regions that were different uh, across the entire brain and two of these were the hubs of the default mode network. Well, these are expert meditators. Great, who cares, right? Well, what about novices? How about folks that want to quit smoking? Can we actually see something there? So we paired up with Amy Jane. She was at Harvard at the time. She's now at the NIH where we could use her, parrot, her smoking cue reactivity paradigm at baseline, scan people's brains to see how reactive they were to cigarette cues. We could randomize them to get our, our smoking app or the National Cancer Institute's quit guide, and then we could scan them a month later to see if we could predict outcomes. Long story short, we, could, we found a direct correlation between a reduction in posterior cingulate activity and a reduction in cigarette smoking. So, how can we actually apply all of this? And how does this actually work when it comes to changing behaviors? Well, there's a very well-known formula. Uh, it was developed back in the 1970s by Rescorla and Wagner, suggesting that it's not about will, willpower is not in this equation at all. It's all about awareness. And what they suggest is that the more we pay attention to a behavior 
and see if it's rewarding, we're gonna do it again. It's called a positive prediction error. If we see that it's not rewarding, we're gonna become disenchanted and stop doing it. And in fact, these formulae are so powerful. These are, these are at the heart of how uh, folks are training AI models because this is such a, a dominant paradigm. So what's this look like in real life? Well, we can actually have people pay attention as they overeat in our clinical trials. And it turns out that it doesn't take very long for somebody to see that overeating doesn't very, feel very good and that reward value drops below zero. Uh, you can see this in this large uh, community-based study that we did, or as people are reporting, uh, this person said, dear sneaky habit loop that says eating junk food is fun. I'm on to you, right? So we start to see, wait a minute, this is not so rewarding. We get that negative prediction error, and that's what drives behavior change. We see the same thing in smoking. In the interest of time, I don't go through the details, but you can see reward value drops as people pay attention as they smoke cigarettes. Or as this person put it, today all the cigarettes I smoked were disgusting. So what I want to uh, kind of leave us all with is that what I would suggest is that we've actually been looking in the wrong direction for behavior change, for habit change. We've been looking at you know, relying on the, at best, the youngest and the weakest parts of our brain. When in fact, we've got this very old evolutionarily conserved process that is very strong. Why not subvert, subvert that dominant paradigm, right? And what we've, what we've found, is that we can actually bring in simple awareness practices like being curious instead of, you know, well, what's it feel like when we have a craving? What's it feel like when we're curious about those feelings? You know, we've done studies on this. Curiosity feels better than a craving. What's it feel like when we're worrying versus what's it feel like when we get curious about those physical sensations when we're feeling anxious? Curiosity feels better. So we can actually tap into these naturally reinforcing processes that we all have and they will become self-fostering because they are more rewarding than these old behaviors. So just to bring this to a close, how'd my patient do, right? I sent him home to start uh, mapping out these habit loops that he'd had around anxiety. He comes back two weeks later, the first thing he says to me is, hey doc, I lost 14 pounds. And I looked at him because we hadn't talked about weight loss yet, we were focusing on anxiety. He said, you know, I realize that I eat fast food, it's my addiction, you know, that's how he put it and it wasn't helping me, so I stopped doing it. He went on to lose over 100 pounds, he is, and this was four years ago now. He is still losing weight gradually, which is healthy, and he said it's the easiest weight loss he's ever had. How about his anxiety? Six months into treatment, I was walking out of our School of Public Health at Brown University on Main Street, very busy street, car pulls up, guy rolls down his window, it's my patient, I'm thinking, great, he's driving on busy streets now, because he had, he had panic attacks driving on highways. I, and he said, hey doc, I'm an Uber driver now. I'm headed to the airport to pick someone up. So I wanna end there by suggesting that we actually all have this power uh, within us. And it's really about tapping into how rewarding it is to step out of these old habits. You can read this quote for yourself, but I just wanna highlight how this person talked about how you know, the, the benefits of feeling inner peace, balanced life. This is what main, mind training is all about. We can actually leverage those. And as this person put it, weight loss was a side effect. So I'll just uh, stop there. And I wanna say one, and Michael mentioned this briefly, one paradigm that we're starting to bring this back to. So I'm trained as an, as an addiction psychiatrist. I hadn't really felt comfortable developing tools to help people with addictions. This is 20 years ago. It was like, we're not ready yet. We're now um, seeing replicability and uh, in, in our pilot testing in, in bringing this to addictions and also in my own clinic treatment, that we're starting to bring this uh, to addiction treatment as well. So if you're interested in that, come find me later and we can talk more. I'll just stop there. I know I'm over time, so apologies for that. I just wanna thank all the folks that contributed to this work uh, and thank you all for being here and listening. Thank you. <laughs>